supplement the NPT. But many NSG members believe it should serve to strengthen the NPT too, reinforcing the norm of adherence by non-nuclear weapon states and underlining the benefits of membership. And Mr. Actor uh, referred to that debate in his remarks. So this makes NSG relations with non-NPT parties, both in terms of trade with non-NPT parties and the possibility of those parties being members, a sensitive topic. In the area of trade, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, the two most prominent developments are the 2008 exemption to India, the exemption from the requirements of full scope safeguards as a requirement for new supply arrangements, led by the United States, which at the time was framed as a unique exception to NSG rules, rather than one being based on specific conditions being met. And then in 2010, the announcement by China that it intended to supply two further reactors to Pakistan, Chashma 3 and 4, um, claiming that these were grandfathered by existing bilateral cooperation agreement, a position opposed by the United States. Then in the area of membership, uh, as you know, the United States announced in 2010 that it would support Indian membership of the NSG along with its membership of the Australia group uh, for uh, Chem Bio, uh, the Wassenaar arrangements on conventional arms, and the MTCR. And a structured dialogue on Indian NSG participation is being held uh, with major exporters, including the US, Russia, the UK, France, and other Western states in favor of Indian membership, while a number of states, uh, most prominently China, hold reservations. Um, and the question of Pakistani membership has also come up in this context, with Pakistan making a formal application to join this year. And in June 2016, the sole plenary ended without a decision being made on Indian membership. I would say there are three closely related questions uh, under consideration here. Firstly, how should the NSG go about making decisions on trade with non-parties to the NPT? Secondly, how should the NSG go about making decisions on the participation of NPT non-parties in the NSG? And thirdly, um, at the root of both these questions, should India remain a unique exception to existing NSG requirements in terms of trade and potential membership? Now getting to the question of, of possible conditions or criteria or, or factors. On the question of trade, uh, a variety of possible conditions have been suggested, which include, but also build upon and go beyond, those made, uh, uh, those imposed on India prior, prior to the 2008 exception. Now, what, what I'm about to cover is not an exhaustive list of every uh, proposal, uh, and I'm not making a personal recommendation, uh, but this is just an attempt to map out the scope of those uh, proposals which have been made. Um, and they include some proposals drawn both from reports of the Carnegie Endowment, um, and also some made in uh, our IISS colleague, Mark Fitzpatrick, uh, Mark Fitzpatrick's book on uh, uh, um, Pakistan's nuclear program. So firstly, in the area of non-proliferation commitments, um, the proposals have included voluntary adherence to uh, some provisions of the NPT, <coughs> including Articles 1 and 6, um, some action on the T CTBT, or a strengthened test moratorium, some action on the negotiation of an FMCT, a clear separation between civilian and military programs and placing civilian program under IAEA safeguards, including signing and ratifying an additional protocol, uh, refraining from the transfer of enrichment and reprocessing related uh, technology, the adoption of comprehensive export controls, the ad adherence to N NSG guidelines, um, and resolving past issues of proliferation activity. In a second area, the second area I would say is, relates to nuclear security commitments. <laughs> These could include ratification of the amended Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material, CPBNM, uh, ratification of the International Convention for Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism, except. Thirdly, uh, an area which I won't go into in much detail, but it uh, covers nuclear safety commitments. And then fourthly, a bundle of additional commitments which might be specific to the state uh, under consideration. So this could include commitments to disarmament or arms control or regional stability. It could also include counter-terrorism uh, measures. Now these discussions are then relevant 
to the further question of participation or, mem or membership in the NSG. In 1997, INSERC uh, 539 defined some factors for considering states' participation in the NSG, and there are five of them. The first is the ability to supply NSG-controlled items. The second is the state's adherence to the two sets of guidelines and action taken to implement them. Thirdly, the enforcement of legally based domestic export control, uh, a legally based domestic export control system to give effect to that uh, commitment to the guidelines. Fourthly, and perhaps most problematically, adherence to one or more treaties such as the NPT or a nuclear weapons free zone treaty or an equivalent non-proliferation agreement and full compliance with such an agreement. And then lastly, support for international efforts towards non-proliferation of nuclear weapons and their delivery vehicles. Now, as Mr. Acton mentioned, some states are concerned that admitting a non-NPT member would weaken the, uh, to the NSG would weaken the NPT by reducing the perceived benefits of non-nuclear weapon state status. Others, on the other hand, argue that the NSG can help to strengthen non-proliferation by complementing the NPT, and that participation by a non-NPT state should be possible if those states are suitable candidates. Now, of course, <clears throat> more bluntly, there are, of course, geopolitical questions at play in this discussion as well. In particular, do states place the development of strategic relationships above the maintenance of non-proliferation norms? And this is crucial. Um, I don't have a personal recommendation on this issue, but I would be interested in raising a set of questions um, to hear more from our fellow participants today <clears throat> from the perspective of Pakistan as a potential member of the NSG. Uh, and in that context, I have five questions. Firstly, what would be the potential benefits of NSG membership for Pakistan? Ms. Agda uh, covered this topic um, and, and suggested some benefits, but I would like to respond to his um, remarks by asking a further question, which is, what of the, which of those benefits are unique to participation in the NSG as opposed to participating in trade with NSG members? What is it about membership in particular um, uh, uh, that, that is important when compared, for example, to voluntary adherence to NSG guidelines in the absence of, of membership? Secondly, in terms of expectations, what does Pakistan believe it will be asked to do to meet the requirements for NSG membership? Thirdly, out of that list of uh, commitments I, I mentioned earlier in non-proliferation, in nuclear security, in nuclear safety, and other um, areas, which will be the hardest or most controversial uh, to implement, because it's usually the hardest and <coughs> most controversial ones which are the most interesting. So which among those lists uh, is the most difficult? Fourthly, in the context of a discussion uh, about participation in the NSG of an of a, a applicant state, how should past cases of proliferation activity best be addressed? What is the appropriate model for having that conversation? And then fifthly and lastly, what is the appropriate relationship between NSG membership on the one hand and uh, adherence to or strengthening other non-proliferation and disarmament in instruments on the other, including in particular uh, matters related to the CTBT uh, and especially, I think, in this context, uh, negotiations on an FMCT. And with that list of questions, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Harris. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matthew Harris, for your uh, presentation. And now I call upon our uh, last uh, speaker, but certainly not last in any way, outstanding scholar, and academic, and uh, now the uh, head of. Prominent think tank, Islamabad, Dr. Zafar Ipal Jima. Dr. Jima is the president of the Strategic Vision Institute in Islamabad uh, and the former dean, faculty of social sciences, meritorious professor and chairman of the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies, DSS, of the Kaidiazam University.
2005 to 2008. He also served as professor head of Department of Strategic and National Security and National and, and Nuclear Studies, Faculty of Contemporary Studies, National Defense University, Islamabad. Uh, he was previously professor and chairman of uh, DSS Mayazam in 1993 to 1998. Dr. Chima authored a book titled Indian Nuclear Deterrence, Its Evolution, Development, and Implications for South Asian Security in 2010, and edited another title, Shifting Dynamics and Emerging Power Equilibrium in South and Central Asia around post-2014. Uh, he has published vastly, including uh, research papers, book chapters, most of which are on South Asia. Yes. So he has uh, several postdoctoral awards to his grade and has 35 years of postgraduate research and teaching experience. Dr. Chima, I give you the floor, sir. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> speaker, I should be at a natural disadvantage not to say something new which most of the members have already said. But anyway, I adhere to my original thinking and perspective on the subject. I do not look into proliferation as only an instrument of peace, as many members of this or this assembly do. To me, proliferation is part of politics and a part of international politics. And being a part of international politics, it is based on two major factors. The strategic priorities of the great powers. Whether or not the great powers would like another country, whether that country is a friendly country or an adversary country, to acquire nuclear weapons. And that's what is the main deciding factor. The main deciding factor whether or not a new country should go nuclear is not the impact on international peace and security, but what kind of that country has a relationship with the great powers. United States of America, West, the former Soviet Union, or maybe Russia now. As we have seen, United States of America opposing France going nuclear in the mid-60s and Soviet Union opposing China going nuclear in 1967. So the basic rationale for proliferation is not as claimed regional international security, but the strategic priorities of the powers that be who decide these basic factors. Second is the commercial interest, especially with reference to NSG, it is the commercial interest of the leading technological powers which decides, which is a decisive factor whether or not a new country should be admitted in the nuclear supplies block. Uh, I would like to be slightly disagree with the honorable DG Dissonment, who are, uh, we are as a nation clamoring for a criteria based approach to nuclear supplies drop. There is no criteria of international politics. So there cannot be a criteria of membership to the nuclear supplies job. It is based on the strategic, political, and commercial interest of the membership of the nuclear supplies job. In view of that, they will decide whether a North country should be admitted. I don't think I have to repeat history of proliferation here, India's proliferation history, and Pakistan's proliferation. This is too educated an audience to do that kind of <coughs> an exercise. As Honorable Matthew Harris has pointed out, it is an ironical anecdotal that NSG was created after the 1974 Indian protest. The rationale for which it exists today and has existed at that time. And over a period of time it has changed very fundamentally. The second important aspect in proliferation, NSG, CTBT, FMCT, 
is a disregard for national security of states. That's the main reason that you have to take into account. If there is a partial failure of the NPT, if there is a partial failure of the international nuclear order, and if there is a partial failure or complete failure of the CTBT, the FMCT, the reason is it is a, a disregard for national security of the states. And national security of the state is the primary factor of international politics, international relations, and cooperation between states. If some of you, I'm sure, very ordinary audience, but some of you have not cared to read the Charter of Constitutional Disarmament. The pivot of the Constitutional Disarmament is state security. <coughs> Everything else is secondary. FMCT, CTBT, other treaties are only to promote state security, and if they do not promote state security, they are not sectoral.